Good afternoon um, or morning, depending on where you are tuning in from. My name is Sydney Yeager, and I'm the Senior Public Programs Producer of the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a Living Memorial to the Holocaust. Uh, I'm so pleased to welcome you to uh, today's event, the Collection Showcase on Jewish Women's Marriage Customs. Um, here at the museum, we are dedicated to the crucial mission of educating our diverse community about Jewish life and heritage before, during, and after the Holocaust. As part of that mission, our programs illuminate the stories of survivors, broader histories of hate and anti-Semitism, stories of resistance against injustice, and more. Um, thank you so much for joining us today virtually. We hope that you will visit the museum in person to see our current exhibitions um, and perhaps some of the objects that you will uh, see today, um, but also uh, we encourage you to see Courage to Act, Rescue in Denmark, the museum's first exhibition for visitors ages nine and up. Um, you can learn more and buy tickets on our website. Uh, closed captions are available on today's program and instructions on how to turn captions on or off are posted in the chat. Um, if you have questions for our speakers during the program, please put them in the Zoom Q&A box, so not the chat, the Q&A. Um, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the hour. Today, we are so honored to be joined by Professor Judy Teeter Bommel Schwartz and Allison Ruman. Judy is the director of the Finkler Institute of Holocaust Research, the Abraham and Adita Spiegel Family Professor in Holocaust Research, the Rabbi Pincus Brenner Professor in Research on the Holocaust of European Jewry, and Professor of Modern Jewish History at Bar Ilan University in Israel. She's also a historian curator of the Holocaust, What He Can Do. Allison recently graduated from Columbia University with a Master of Arts in European History, Politics, and Society, where she studied the intersection of Christianity and mining art in early modern Central Europe. Before coming to New York, Allison graduated from Penn State University with, a ba with bachelor's of arts degrees in German, political science and classics and ancient Mediterranean studies and earned several minors and certificates in history and international studies related fields. She wrote her undergraduate thesis on far right extremism and post-war Germany. Uh, Allison has completed internships in several institutions related to her areas of interest, including the German Historical Institute, the Clinton Foundation, and this museum's Holocaust Educator Internship in 2021. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. And uh, now I'm going to hand things over to Sarah Softness, the museum's curator of special projects. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad to see you all here. Um, I'm just going to give a brief 30 second Welcome, just to say that it has been once again my joy to, um, in our second iteration of the Haskell T. Door Curatorial Internship, to work both with Judy and with Allison, who has been a total joy to supervise and whose work on this project I am so excited for all of you to get to see, which not only gives you a glimpse into how Allison thinks and how a little bit how the department, um, you know, uh, allows our interns to uh, learn throughout their internship, um, but also an amazing showcase of objects inside our permanent collection, which is um, really always a delight to get to share with uh, interested parties. So um, I just want to also note that our next round of the Haskell T. Dork Curatorial Internship has applications now open. Um, if you know anyone who's interested, if you yourself are interested, please do uh, head to our website and learn more. And um, I'm sure Allison would be happy to uh, fill anyone in who, who would love more details. So with that, I'm gonna kick it off to Allison and thanks again all for coming. Welcome. Okay, hi everybody. Um, so thank you so much for joining me today. Um, today, uh, on the heels of Women's History Month, I am going to be talking about Jewish um, women's marriage customs. Um, and so um, until the late Middle Ages, um, marriage in Judaism consisted of two ceremonies. And so the first was an engagement and the second was the actual marriage. And so to those of us who grew up in the United States, that sounds pretty similar to what we have today. Um, but an engagement in Judaism is very different than, you know, the stereotypical American engagement. It is much more binding. It was um, 
uh, you know, a very religious thing. Um, once you were engaged in Judaism, you would need a religious divorce um, to for that to be dissolved. Um, and also, um, once you were engaged in Judaism, you the marriage would happen a year later. And that is very different today. Today, um, the two ceremonies happen pretty much at once. You have the engagement ceremony and then you do the marriage ceremony right after. And um, marriage is very important in Judaism, um, partly because of the persecution that the Jewish community has faced for millennia. Um, you know, marriage is something that has kept the Jewish community uh, going in the face of persecution. So this ceremony is something that is very special to the Jewish community. Um, and as a historian who specializes in material culture and historiography, I'm very interested in the story that material objects um, have to tell and what they say about the people that create them. So I think that we can learn just as much about a person or a culture by the objects that they create and preserve or what they don't preserve um, as we can by studying that person or culture themselves. Um, and that's kind of the lens through which I was looking at the collections when I was, um, you know, kind of deciding what I wanted to do this program um, about. You know, of course, taking into account extreme situations such as fleeing persecution, which certainly counts. That that's kind of what I was what I was thinking. You know, why were people preserving these items? What was special about them? What made people want? these items to be remembered? What did it say about them? Uh, things of that nature. So that that's kind of the mindset I was in. That's what I was working with. And like I said, as I was going through the collections, I kept seeing things that said marriage, 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 wedding, wedding, wedding. But they were not on like wedding dresses or wedding rings. They were on other objects and they all had to do with things that were relegated to women. And I thought that was that was really interesting, especially because, you know, historically women have been so restricted in what they have been allowed to do. I thought, especially, you know, with Women's History Month, it could be a really great chance to explore not only the opportunities that women had, but to explore things that were reserved specifically for women. And I also wanted an opportunity to highlight the different cultures, you know, within the Jewish diaspora. Um, I, as I was searching through the collections, I thought it was really cool to see how one tradition within the Jewish culture could manifest so differently around the world. You know, you could you could take one thing and it looks so differently, whether it was in Syria or England or South America. And I thought that was so beautiful and something to be celebrated. And that is also something that I wanted to highlight. Um, but I think the thing that really motivated me to do this presentation um, was uh, this woman and this artifact, the marriage wig worn by Devorah Ensenberg. And so Orthodox Jewish women cover their hair as a sign of modesty. Sometimes um, the first encounter between Rebecca and Isaac is cited uh, as you know a reason for this. There doesn't seem to be a clear consensus on this, but in any case, Orthodox women cover their hair. Um, and one way to do this is to wear a wig. And it is customary on a woman's wedding night that she will receive a wig that she will then wear in public to cover her hair. And so um, pictured here is Devorah Enzenberg, who was Judy's um, great grandmother. And Devorah lived in Mihawa, which is now part of what is now um, Romania with her husband Nachman and their family. And much of Devorah's family ended up being deported to the Mogilev ghetto in the summer of 1941. And sadly, she and her husband and their daughter Miriam all died of starvation there in 1942. Uh, but her daughter Jenny survived 
And Jenny saved um, Devorah's marriage wig and eventually emigrated to the United States in the late 1950s. And Jenny eventually gave the marriage wig to her niece, who was Judy's mother. And Judy got the wig uh, after her mother died. And Judy has donated it to the museum. And I don't think I can quite put it into words how special and meaningful this donation is. I mean, first of all, this marriage wig is from 1895. So just the fact that it it is that old and it has lasted that long. This wig is made of human hair. So that in and of itself, it is an invaluable piece of the collection. Um, so from the material perspective, it is a, a wonderful object to have in our collection. But also, you know, the sentimentality behind it. It is such an important part of an Orthodox woman's spirituality, um, you know, and, and just the intimate nature of the wig. But then also, you know, the legacy of the family and, and all of the hardships that they had to endure and the strength that, you know, Jenny had to, to have for that wig to make it to the United States, all of that wrapped up in, into one, like the meaning that this wig has. And for Judy to, you know, give this to the museum and for us to honor that legacy, like I just can't put it into words in a meaningful way. So this, like learning about this, that's really what inspired me to do this entire presentation. Okay, so um, the engagement contract is not specifically required by Jewish law. Um, and the engagement contracts uh, had much significance when uh, marriages were arranged. So the two families would come together and uh, agree on financial arrangements, such as the dowry, bride price, uh, penalties, if either party backed out. And then they would also come to agreements on things like um, engagement and marriage ceremonies, times and dates of the ceremonies, things like that. Uh, then they would sign them. And after the documents were signed, the mothers of the bride and groom would break a plate to, uh, and this was typically interpreted to represent the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, and also to demonstrate that once an engagement was broken, it could not be mended. And so these are three of the um, engagement contracts that the museum has in its collection. They're all about 50 years apart from each other. And I just think this represents the spectrum of character that exists within the Jewish community. So rings are not actually required in Jewish weddings. Um, They're just the most common way, since the Middle Ages at least, of fulfilling the bride price requirement. And the bride price requirement was originally paid to the bride's family because when a bride got married, she would go to live with the groom's family. And as such, the bride's family would be losing a valuable worker. So in order to offset that loss and the loss of value, the groom would give an object of value to the bride's family. And as I said, the most common way of doing this since the Middle Ages was to give um, an object of value uh, or, or the ring. Um, so the rule was that the bride price must have a monetary value of no less than a single pruta, which was the smallest denomination of currency used during the Talmudic era. And that low value was to ensure that um, there was no financial barrier to access marriage. And the ring that you see on the right is actually part of our core exhibition. So you can come to the museum and see this in person for yourself. So these are the base of a mikvah clog. The straps are not part of the clog anymore, but they would have 
straps, then you would put them on like regular shoes and the bride would wear them to the mikvah bath um, in preparation for marriage. And the mikvah is a ritual bath that Jewish people immerse themselves in for ritual purification. And the ritual purification would happen for various reasons. Um, conversion to Judaism is certainly one of them. Uh, before Yom Kippur could be another. And certainly brides immerse themselves in the mikvah uh, before the wedding. Uh, it would happen within four days before the wedding and seven days after menstruation. And traditions for this actually vary between different Jewish communities. So in the Ashkenazic tradition, which is the Eastern European Jewish tradition, this is a more private ceremony. So the bride will go with a mother or mother-in-law or a female relative. Um, but in the Sephardic tradition, which is the uh, Spanish or Portuguese uh, communities, the bride is typically accompanied by a host of female relatives and friends. And sometimes they'll throw sugar cubes into the water and the unmarried girls will eat marzipan cakes and they'll have like a whole feast of sweets afterwards. And just like the rings that um, were in the slide before this one, these mikvah clogs are also on view in the core exhibition. So you can also come to the museum and see these in person yourself. Now the bridal trousseau is not specific to a Jewish culture, but it is certainly something that Jewish brides um, partook in. And um, all of the objects that are pictured here came from bridal trousseaus. Um, and a bridal trousseau is a collection of different possessions, such as, you know, clothing, jewelry, linens, things of that nature. Um, and brides-to-be would assemble these things to prepare for their wedding day and marriage and married life. Um, it could also be, a, you know, things that brides might intend to wear for the rehearsal dinner or welcome party, but it was typically things that they would use for um, their wedding, or I'm sorry, for um, married life. Um, and historically, trousseaus were also status symbols. So the larger and the richer that the trousseau was, the um, more elevated that the bride's position was in that society. And unless a family was very wealthy, um, the garments were typically hand sewn by a female relative. So a grandmother, an aunt, a mother, sometimes even the girl herself. Um, and so I've, you know, the things here would be typical of a trousseau, you know, a tablecloth, an apron, pillowcase, things of that nature. And the details are really beautiful. Um, so I wanted to give everybody an opportunity to see some of the details more closely, just because I know it is a little difficult to see them on Zoom. So for me, the wedding dress is like the quintessential part of a wedding. Like when I think wedding, I immediately think wedding dresses. And I think that these three wedding dresses, like at the beginning, I was talking about wanting to highlight different um, Jewish communities around the world. And I think that these three wedding dresses do a wonderful job of that. First of all, this orange wedding dress in the middle is without a doubt my favorite object in the collection. I mean, it was love at first sight. I saw it and it like there was no looking back. I, I knew that I had to feature it somehow. Um, it like absolutely beautiful. But, you know, these these three dresses are from relatively the same time, um, but they all look so different. Um, 
But I think the thing that is so beautiful and so wonderful about them is they were all worn by a Jewish woman at a Jewish wedding, marrying a Jewish man, but they were in different parts of the world, you know, in different cultures, experience, experiencing different things, but they had that common thread connecting them of, you know, that Jewish culture. And I, I think that is something that is so beautiful and so wonderful and something that should be celebrated that, you know, we, something that is so different, but still has that common connection. And I think these dresses do a wonderful job of like succinctly summarizing that. So whereas the engagement contracts laid out the details for the engagement and marriage ceremonies, the marriage contract called the ketuba and the plural is ketubat, um, they lay out the details for the actual marriage union. And so traditionally, the ketuba would detail the obligation of the groom to the bride. Um, so it might say something along the lines of the groom is obligated to provide the bride with food, clothing, um, marital relations, and then, you know, also something like the groom is obligated to provide the bride with financial compensation in the event that the marriage should dissolve due to uh, divorce or death. And these were originally designed to protect the bride um, from being abandoned by her husband um, or forced to divorce against her will. Um, so, you know, obviously these were created because women and men had different positions in society and, you know, different freedoms and different abilities to move freely within societies. Um, but times change and, um, you know, times progress and we have different abilities to move freely within societies. And so today, um, you know, many Jewish people have adapted Ketubat to be more gender inclusive or address um, different concerns. Um, in any case, they are signed in the presence of two witnesses who also sign the Ketubat and they are read under the chuppah, under the, um, under the marriage canopy. And they are typically read aloud in the original Aramaic uh, in which they are written. And uh, by the way, this was without a doubt the most difficult slide for me to curate. Like these are the most beautiful documents I have ever seen in my life. And the museum has well over 100 of them. And it took me at least a week of just going through my, um, my list of them, just looking back and forth between all of the different ones I had to choose from. And it was so hard for me to make a decision because again, I really wanted to showcase, you know, different cultures. Um, you know, so you can see we have one from Florence, we have one from Syria, and I have, um, you can see them a bit closer up. Um, the one on the right is from 1748, just giving you, um, you know, another idea just of the extent of the museum scope. Um, and again, the detailing is just so beautiful. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it was just, I, I just, I could not decide. It was so hard. And um, the ketubah on the left actually has a special Sephardic script, um, which is why I included it because I thought that was really neat. Um, but yeah, well over 100 and they are, they are so, so however beautiful you think these are, just know there were many, many, many runners up, many contenders. Um, and if you like the Ketuba on the left, that one is also on view in the core exhibition. So you can feel free to come to the museum and view it yourself and probably see, you can probably see the writing more clearly and maybe read it if you want. But um, yeah, just know, so beautiful. And I, ca I can't say enough like how gorgeous these things are. Um, so this last slide is 
very, very special to me. And I want to start out by saying that I did not set out to include it. Um, I wasn't in, intending to have this be part of it at all. It just kind of happened. These these just were a part of the, when I was trying to make the other categories, they just showed up in the searches that I was looking for. Um, I think it's fair to say that all civilizations throughout history have sought to promote their idea of perfection and in doing so um, have attempted to sideline um, marginalized groups, whatever that may look like or whoever that may be. Um, and whether that's actively removing their representation or uh, deeming their circumstances un unworthy of remembering or deeming other people's circumstances more worthy of remembering than theirs, um, the dominating conventions have excluded their experiences from cultural memory. So when something that resists a culture's version of the ideal is preserved. I think that that is so special because first of all, it shows resistance and perseverance in the face of adversity. And secondly, it shows co the complexity of humans and complexity is what makes us fun and interesting. So on the left, we have a Halitz issue. And so if in some, in some cultures, not, not all, but in some, um, in some communities, excuse me, if there is a woman whose husband dies and they do not have any children, she has an obligation to marry her husband's brother. If they do not want to get married, the process by which they would uh, avoid that obligation is called chalitza. And it is definitely a process. Um, there are many steps that they have to go through and this shoe is involved. Um, and if anybody is interested in learning about it, it is laid out in, Deut in Deuteronomy 25. Um, you put the shoe on, you take the shoe off, there's spitting involved. Um, there's like a whole you know, list of things that you have to do. But in any case, you know, clearly this was done um, because this shoe was used and somebody felt the need to preserve it and somebody felt the need to honor its legacy. And now we have the honor of honoring its legacy and its memory. And then on the right, we have a letter asking for help in marrying a daughter whose father died. And in the translation of this letter, the family is basically saying like, Rabbi, please, please help us. It's going to be so hard to marry her off. It's basically going to be impossible. Like, please give us any help you can. And this this letter is from 1929-1930. So that just goes to show still in the 20th century the importance of family and familial relationships and the stigma against anybody who didn't have that, you know, hallmark card picture perfect um stereotypical family. Um and so I, I think that it is so important and so special that these things were created and preserved and that somebody along the line, whether it was the people who made them or received them or somebody connected to them, thought that they were important in one way or another to preserve them for whatever reason, um, you know, that they should be remembered and gave them to an institution whose mission is to remember things like this. Because even though we go to 
such lengths to preserve and uplift the idealized family and the idealized marriage, those of us who fall outside of those metrics are still part of the community and are worthy of being in it and are worthy of being remembered. So it feels like, so Judy, it feels like even with all of those elements that I presented, I'm still only scratching the surface. Are there any other wedding traditions with women that you know of or are fond of um, and want to mention? There are various traditions throughout the world that have to do with weddings. What you have presented, Allison, is fascinating. In a minute, I'll add to a couple of the stories that you were telling. But yes, there are various traditions that are extremely dependent. They're culturally dependent. In other words, wedding traditions of Jews who come from Oriental countries, countries in the East, are different than those who come from countries in Europe, Western Europe, North Africa. They're all different, um, having to do with, again, it's more like appropriation of various traditions that aren't necessarily Jewish. They're, people don't think, they think of the Jews as being this completely separate society. Well, they weren't. In other words, somebody once said that if you take the number of Jews that purportedly lived at the time of the Second Temple and you expound, or whatever it's called, exponential to today, the, the Jews should be something like 100 billion. So where do they all go? So a lot were killed. Yes, it's true. But it's not so simple. You have people coming into Judaism, people coming out of Judaism. There's a lot of contact with society around them. And so you'll find that Eastern, meaning Oriental Jews, have a lot of Oriental traditions in their wedding ceremonies. And in their, not the actual wedding ceremony is a bride and a groom, two witnesses, a ketubah, that's a marriage contract. And the groom has to give the bride something that's worth more than a certain amount of money. To, so she has to accept it. He has to say, you are consecrated to me by the laws of Israel, etc. Other than that, everything else has just been added on. That's the basis, which is why, of course, whenever um, religious schools would have like eighth grade trips to Washington, D.C., I had to always be careful that one of the boys who was already over bar mitzvah age wasn't playing around and said something. There was once a case like this. It's, it's a serious thing. You're married after you do that, if you've got two witnesses who fill the... So, but everything else, what you wear, how you wear it. Um, one example is the, um, in Lubavitch, there was a Lubavitch Hasidim. There is a tradition of wearing a raincoat with one arm off. Why? This comes from the time in Russia when Jews, in order not to be drafted into the Tsar's army, would pretend that they had been maimed, that they only have one arm. So it became a tradition that you wore a raincoat. Why? Because you got married outdoors, probably under the chuppah, but with one arm off at the wedding ceremony, all sorts of things like that, that are very unique, interesting traditions. And so, yes, you have those in, in Eastern countries, you have North African traditions that Oh, I could go into it forever, but what you have shown us is absolutely fascinating. I do want to add two little stories to the stories that you told. The one is about my great-grandmother's wig. Um, if I'm going to be honest, I didn't know my great-grandmother. She died in 1942. I was born quite a while after that. But the stories that I've heard is she didn't exactly love that wig. And the reason that she didn't was how it actually was worn. My great-grandmother got married at 17. Vora Scharf married Nachman Enzenberg, who was this big, she's tiny little woman. We have the pictures and he was this big, strapping, very handsome farmer and, and woodcutter. And um, I like Mutt and Jeff. But she had long flowing red hair, really, really, really long red hair. And he loved her hair and she loved her hair. And the morning after the wedding, the women from the town, her mother or whatever, are supposed to come and they're supposed to shave her head so that she puts, she refused. She absolutely refused. She said, my Nachman says, I'm keeping my hair. Oh, what the women of Mihava thought of her, so terrible. So the compromise was that she would put her hair up under the wig, but of course she pulled some out and it was very, once upon a time, the, that wig was a little bit lighter in color. And, um, and they didn't like that. And Nachman loved her hair. And what happened was that a year later, her firstborn daughter, my grandmother, was born. 
And a couple of months after that, my grandmother fell ill with probably what was diphtheria from the description. Nachman was away. Far was this 18-year-old with a new baby. She was scared stiff. She ran to the women on the two sides of where her house was. Her mother was all the way down the lane. So she first went to a neighbor. What should I do? What should I do? The women of Mirva had a field day. They said, oh, now we're going to do something. Devora, this comes from your sin of not having your hair cut. Oh, no, what? They took, she said, well, you have to agree. We will shave your head now and maybe your daughter will recover. She was 18 years old. She was scared out of her wits. Nachman wasn't there to do anything about it. And they sat her down and they shaved off all her long, imagined hair, like halfway down to the ground. All that red hair went and they put the wig on her head without anything showing out. Well, my grandmother lived, obviously, whether it had to do with shaving the head or not, but Nachman came home that day. And when he found out what happened, he took his ax and he started swinging. And if Dvorah hadn't stopped him, half of Mihova wouldn't have been there afterwards. But that's the story of, and she never grew her hair back again. However, many of her descendants, my mother included, had bright red hair taking after her. Till today, there are great, great, great grandchildren who have that bright red hair of, of the sharps. And uh, so that's the story of her marriage wig. So she, let us say, had a very um, dichotomous feeling towards that wig. It was not so simple. So that was the first thing. The second thing is about the chalitza, the, the chalitza um, shoe that you have. It's actually a sandal that has strings or, or ribbons around it. Uh, the thing is that in the time of the Bible and afterwards in the time of the second temple, you had a choice. Meaning the whole idea was actually to protect women. It sounds like it's something so disgusting. A woman who would find herself without children, without a husband, was in trouble in those days. And the idea was that she could not be left alone. In other words, there would always be somebody who would take care of her financially. And that would be her husband's brother. The only thing is that at a certain point, it was impossible to do it. And therefore, the option of what's called yibum, that is marrying your husband's brother no longer existed. And any woman in those circumstances had to perform the act of chalitza. Why the Kalisher society had a shoe like that is very interesting. It's because in the United States, we had many, many cases at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century, at the time of the great immigration to the United States, that's over a period of 35 years, 2,200,000 Jews came over to America from Europe, and we're just talking about the United States, not even North America, South America. It's a tremendous amount of people. People had a tendency sometimes to um, disappear, people died young, etc. and women would find themselves in such a situation. And therefore, the actual society, the people joined these Landsmannschaft, societies based on the place that they came from in Europe, the society, had all the necessary religious accoutrements. They also had a chuppah and they had everything else. Who had the money for these things? And so therefore, uh, it's pretty much a shoe that may have very well been in use, taking into account how many young men, newlyweds without children, found themselves dead of various diseases and epidemics when they came to the United States. So that's the story of the collar shoe. That's, that's how it eventually stayed around and hit the museum. Wow, that is so fascinating. Well, thank you so much for that background information. And of, of course, the amazing story about your family. I mean, the the bright red hair. I, 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 I love how that just, you know, lives on, you know, through 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 this, your descendants. Um, so I was wondering, do you know of any um, contemporary trends or changes in Jewish marriage customs for women um, that are worth noting? Yes, yes, very much so. Today, there is nothing that says that, as I said, the only thing you have to have at a Jewish, religious Jewish wedding ceremony is you've got to have a bride, you've got to have a groom, you've got to have two witnesses, you've got to have a ketubah, and you have to have, whether it's a ring or anything that is worth more than two prutot, more than that. And therefore, for example, master of ceremonies, in many cases, um, the the master of ceremonies becomes a mistress of ceremonies. And you yeah. have women who want to have a semi-egalitarian wedding, including very, very orthodox women, yeah. often have somebody for 
master or mistress of ceremonies, they use friends, women mm. who do that. Another possibility is it's already become customary in certain circles that when you call up each time a different person to say one of the seven blessings, which are given after the actual wedding ceremony, that they call up couples, a husband and a wife or, or a man and a woman who read the blessing together in order to incorporate more women into the ceremony. Because one of the criticisms that feminists had of the Jewish wedding ceremony is that the bride is mute. She doesn't do anything. She accepts the ring in cases, various cases. They also have a ceremony that is a... Um, would you say it's kind of like a freeze of the actual wedding ceremony and now we're going to have something inserted in the middle and the bride gives the groom a ring with uh whatever she wants to say at the time it's not part of the actual ceremony and you have to say this is not part of the ceremony but it's done and it's done under the chupa and it's becoming more and more customary wow well thank you so much for those insights and um is there anything else you wanted to share just you know, about your own family or this internship or, yes. you know, anything? <laughs> yes, thank you. I was going to talk about that. Yes. First of all, we are thrilled that my family, the Tibor family, that you have been the Haskell Tidor commemorative um, <laughs> intern at the Museum of Jewish Heritage. It's named after my father, Haskell Tidor, who was a Holocaust survivor. He was born in Bochnia in Poland. He was raised in Germany. He spent all of the war years from 1939 to 1945 in Nazi camps, first in Buchenwald, then in Auschwitz, where he was a um, he was a block secretary who functioned actually as a work dispatcher in practice. And he used the opportunity to save many, many concentration camp inmates from death. There are lots of stories about that. I knew nothing about it during his lifetime. And the first time I actually started hearing the stories was at his funeral when one of his friends who was there got up in the middle of nowhere and started telling the stories about what happened and how many people my father saved. And when I came to him afterwards, I said, how come he never, he said, he didn't want you to know. He didn't, but now he's gone and we're going to tell you. And many of these people have written memoirs and we have down the incredible things that my father did. And um, from Auschwitz, he was taken on the death march to Buchenwald, where he was liberated on April 11th, 1945, along with the rest of the inmates of Buchenwald concentration camp. After which he and a few of the Buchenwald Jewish inmates who were or former inmates who had been liberated, started the first pioneering Hachshara Zionist um, farm in liberated Germany. It was called Kibbutz Buchenwald. It was a kibbutz. And in September 1945, he brought the first group of 111 halutzim, pioneers from Kibbutz Buchenwald, all of whom were young boys and girls, Holocaust survivors. He brought them to pre-state Israel. And Kibbutz Buchenwald then metamorphosed into a kibbutz that exists today, Kibbutz Netzer Sereni. And this was something that my father was the first head of the kibbutz, and he was one of the founders of that kibbutz. So when I look back and I see the things that he did, he was involved in saving lives. Afterwards, he was involved in Zionist endeavors. He was involved in education. He was involved in doing things for the public. And he always said to me, remember, one person makes a very big difference. I never really understood that until after his death when I learned how much that one person, Oscar Tidor, made such a tremendous difference. He ended up in the United States because I have a brother and a sister from my father's first wife who was murdered during the Holocaust who are much older than I am. And they were rescued to America by a Quaker group in the middle of the war, in the middle of World War II, and brought from Southern France to the United States where they found refuge with a uh, wonderful foster family, Lapidises, who took them in and raised them. And my father only found them after the war. And he ended up in the United States and lived there. He met my mother, married, I was born. And then we moved for him back, for us, to Israel about 50 years ago. And we've been here ever since. My father passed away 31 years ago. And I think that he would be 
thrilled to know that there is an endeavor in that has to do with curatorial and the Museum of Jewish Heritage that's named after him. Not probably he would have preferred to be here and see it himself, but then it wouldn't have been named after him. So best, next best thing. Thank you, Judy. It's truly, it's our privilege um, to get to work in his legacy and to have your unbelievable spirit and knowledge undergirding this program. And um, and Allison, thank you so much. That was fabulous. I am so thrilled when even I get to learn about the collection that we sit on top of every day. There's untold stories, right? It's really great. So thank you. Um, all right, so I think we will move into some audience questions before we um, end our time together. So um, I will just start with the ones that have come in. So uh, Allison, I think you can probably start with this one, but anyone else can feel free to chime in. Um, the mikvah clogs that you showed, uh, would those be used once a woman was married and went to the mikvah or um, only before her marriage? I am going to actually pass that one over to Judy. <laughs> It's a very good question. I When I saw it come up on the q and I was thinking, I, I truly don't know. In other words, some type of clog was used, but it could be that these were ceremonial clogs that were only used for brides. That can can make a lot of sense to me. That And, and afterwards, you just used whatever there was around. Um, that sounds to me, they, they look very ornate, and I think they were probably saved for brides the same way that um, the, the entire ceremony when it's done for a bride is done with a lot of a lot of tact and a lot of delicacy afterwards by the 50th time that you're doing this it's not really that delicate it's more like you know go dunk in out but for a bride it's a special very to, to make it wonderful and and the clogs are all part of it thank you um so another question that came in and I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, but uh, what was the uker or the sash used for? Okay, yes. So that one, there was not a lot of notes um, under the object description. Um, it pretty much just said that it was a sash, but I know that it was from the Balkans, I want to say Greece. So I'm thinking that it was more of a cultural thing. Um, or even a familiar, a familial thing. So I'm sorry that I don't have more information for you. It seems that the donors also did not give us more information, um, but I can tell you that it was from Greece. Was this a sash uh, that was supposed to have been used at the chuppah? Because if so, it could be used to tie the bride and the groom together. Perhaps. That's a, that's a non-Jewish custom, but it could have yeah. moved into, into sure. Jewish space, definitely. That's a Greek custom, actually. Oh, oh okay. So makes, makes sense. sense. It's from the Balkans. Yeah. Thank you for that, Judy and Allison as well. Um, so Allison, about your favorite wedding dress, um, where, uh, what country did it come from? So the notes say that it was used in uh, Palestine, but the fabric came from India. It said it was from Bombay, so Mumbai. Thank you. Um, and actually, a lot of people are asking about this, um, but where did the tradition of breaking a glass at a wedding begin? Judy, and anyone can hop yeah, I'm going to take this one. Okay. <laughs> um, it, obviously, after the second temple, because it's supposed to commemorate the destruction of the temple. Exactly when, I don't know, but we know when it was from. It had to be from the year 70 and onward. Lots of things were done to commemorate the destruction of the temple, and this is one of them. So the idea of doing something like that, I, it makes sense to me that it would be second or third century. I'm just taking a guess. Um, actually, I could ask my husband, who's more of an expert in that field in the next room, but I have no idea what he's doing right now. So <laughs> I'll get back That's to okay. you. Well, if he wants <laughs> to know, email me and I'll let you know. Well, We'll save it for, for a future one, uh, but hold on to the answer, Judy. Another historian. Uh, yeah. Um, so 
another question about your 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 favorite dress, Allison, is um, was there any significance to the color of it, or was it just for show? It yeah, I mean there was there were no notes about the significance of the color, and typically, um, the object description and then the object like accompanying notes are very detailed. They, they give background about the family, about the extenuating circumstances, and they will note things like that about, you know, significance of that. And there was nothing in there about why it was a particular color. So if I had to guess, they just wanted it to be orange. <laughs> or if there was a particular reason that it were orange, it would have said. I mean, it's a great color. So, yeah, you know. it's a great color. Why not? <laughs> yeah. Um, so another question that just came in, and uh, Judy, this might be one for you to start with. Where, when, and who signs uh, the the ketubah uh, okay. when a marriage happens? Well, first it happens before the actual ceremony. And the groom usually sits with the fathers and with who's ever going to perform the ceremony. By the way, you really don't need a rabbi to perform the ceremony. As I said, it's a minimum, but it's very customary that it's not done without. And these days, in most countries, the rabbi is also the legal representative of the country. And therefore, if you want your wedding listed, you have to do it with a rabbi. So they sit with him mm -hmm. and he takes out the ketubah. He explains it. There is a small place on the ketubah. Well, first there are places for everybody's names, but besides that, there is a place that there is a, a traditional 200 zuz, certain amount of money that the bride gets as compensation in case of divorce or in case of uh, something happening to her husband and then his heirs have to pay that money to her. But then there's a line after that and it says, and to that I added, and you can put in whatever extra sum you want. I know weddings that almost fell apart over the discussion of how much money mm -hmm. was going to be put into there. And um, I think at mine, the way they got around it was saying, and an additional sum, just didn't, no money, no, no. It, I was going to put in a hundred thousand dollars. You're going to put in $500,000. It's lots of, lots of wonderful arguments. If you haven't had enough arguments about your wedding, you can have another one right there, almost <laughs> under the book, just about that sum of money. And then on the bottom, the bridegroom, has to sign the two witnesses, neither of whom are allowed to be related to the bridegroom and they can't be related to each other. So mm -hmm. people use friends, people use um, brothers of brothers-in-law, things like that who aren't a direct relation, then they sign it and then you're, you're set to go. And from there you go on to the actual wedding. Thank you. Um, so we also have a question, Judy, for you. Can you tell us more about what it was like donating objects to the museum? Oh, it's wonderful. First of all, I, if I, I've donated several. And mm -hmm. one of them is this marriage wig that belonged to my great grandmother, Dora. Another one is um, a, a textile that comes from my husband's side of the family, from his great, great great grandmother and a steamer trunk that that great 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 grandmother's daughter when she came to the United States in in 1893 brought with her in which she had all her worldly goods and it was originally from Elizabeth grad in the Ukraine and the the it was wonderful it was wonderful I I turned to the the people involved in curation and I asked if they would be interested in fact the steamer trunk had been in my my wonderful late mother-in-law's house and she used to say who's going to take this who's going to want it and then when I got involved with the Museum of Jewish Heritage she said, maybe one day the museum will want it and um I, I almost two years ago tragically when she was 99 and a half years old she was run over by a car and she was killed and we had that trunk and I said, okay, it goes to the museum. That was, she wanted that to happen. And I could just imagine her looking down on us and smiling when finally it went to the Museum of Jewish Heritage. That was, that was really her wish. And uh, that and the textile that had belonged to her great, great grandmother. It, a wonderful process with wonderful people. If you have, I'm, I'm, all of you who are listening, if you have any objects that you think are important 
And you don't want your kids and grandchildren to just throw it out one day. It's like, what happened? Why Why did I give away that wig? Because I, I asked my daughter, said, will you want your, somebody said, my great, great grandmother's wig. Oh, like that. I said, oh no, this goes to the museum. Say, yes, mom, give us you the museum. That's wonderful. And now we have several objects that belong to the Ensenberg family, including a picture, the picture that you saw of my great grandmother, Dvorah, that is on the entrance corridor at the beginning of the wonderful exhibit that I was privileged to help curate um, the Holocaust, What Hate Can Do. And please go and see it. And you can see my grandmother there. And if you go up to the next floor, you'll even see some more objects that belong to the family. But I'll leave that open until you actually get there. You'll see them. Thank you so much. And um, Sarah, maybe you can tell us just a little bit more about if people do want to donate objects, what the what what they should do. Yes, if you've identified anything inside your own, your family's collections or things you're not sure might be of interest to the museum, often we talk to folks who say, oh, I had no idea that that could be something that a museum would want to preserve. Um, we have a lot more information on our website, and I do encourage you to get in touch with the curatorial team at collections at mjhnyc.org, um, and we will walk you through the process. We'll ask you tons and tons and tons of questions. Many you may not be able to answer, but um, all part of the research process. And uh, we do look forward to hearing from you. Our, our, our community is so much a part of how we enrich our collections and our holdings. All right, well, we are at the end of our time. So um, I wanna thank you, Allison, for that really excellent presentation and for all the work you put into this. And and Judy also for being here and answering all of these questions for us uh, and sharing your knowledge with us. We really appreciate it. And uh, Sarah, to you as well for uh, your support of this program. Um, so thank you to everybody who is also joining us out there in the internet verse. Uh, if you enjoyed today's program, we hope you will consider making a donation to support the museum at mghnyc.org slash support and joining us for our upcoming programs, which you can find at mghnyc.org slash current events. I'll also just um, echo what Sarah said that if you do have any objects, uh, please email us at collections at mghnyc.org, which is also in the chat.